Hey guys, welcome back. It's Miss More White. Um, so today for AP, we're going to be talking about historical thinking skills. So historical thinking skills for AP World History Modern. There's going to be nine different skills that I'm going to go over and cover during this video. Hopefully I can get it done in about 15 minutes or so. So let's get straight into it and let's see what the first skill is. Skill number one is historical causation. Historical thinking involves the ability to identify, analyze, and evaluate the relationships among multiple historical causes and effects, distinguishing between those that are long-term and proximate, and among coincidence, correlation, and causation. That was a mouthful. So you basically have to be able to identify cause and effect of different historical events. One of the easiest ones that we can talk about is going to be the plague. So the cause of the plague, we can say, hey, let's look back to the Silk Roads. So that trading is going to be one of the initial causes of the plague because there's so much interaction between so many different people, as well as a lack of scientific understanding and scientific knowledge. So those two things are going to be a cause of the plague coming in and decimating much or about one third of the world's population between 1000 and 1300 CE. So proficient students, what are you going to be able to do if you want to pass your AP exam? So you're going to be able to compare uh, causes and or effects, including, including those between short term and long term effects. You're also going to analyze and evaluate the interaction of multiple causes and or effects. So being able to list multiple things as causes and or effects or seeing the connection between those things. And finally, you're going to be able to assess historical contingency by distinguishing among uh, coincidence, causation, and correlation, as well as critiquing existence, existing interpretations of cause and effects. So you're going to say, is this a coincidence? Is this something that's going to happen throughout history over and over again, or is it a one-time thing? Is this a cause and effect moment in history where something is causing an effect? Or is there a connection between these two things happening at the same time or happening in different parts around the world? So you're going to be able to analyze those. And if you want to be effective and pass your AP exam, you're going to be uh, able to properly analyze historical causation. So that's skill number one. All right. Once again, historical causation. Skill number two is going to be patterns of continuity and change over time. So continuity. Sounds like continuing. So we're going to see how things continue over time. That could be religious structures. That could be government styles. That could be any number of things. But change over time means during that same time period, we're going to see how things are going to change over time. I've been mentioning in maps how you're going to look at the same region in maps over and over and over again. You're going to be like, are there any other parts of the world? But they're actually is a major change happening in that region, that change over time. Different leaderships, different government styles, different ownership and control over that land. So you're gonna see change over time happening a lot, specifically in Afro-Eurasia. Once again, Afro-Eurasia, that's that northern part of Africa and uh, Europe and Asia all together, okay? So patterns of continuity and change over time. Historical thinking involves the ability to recognize analyze and evaluate the dynamics of historical continuity and change over periods of time of varying lengths as well as the relating as well as relating these patterns to larger historical processes or themes change over time okay so being able to see how things are going to shift so one way we can look hey let's look at the roman empire we're talking about the roman empire the Roman Empire is going to start off as a very small place, but then eventually the Roman Empire is going to expand to one of the largest, actually the largest geographic um, area for one country to control in our world's history ever. 
So you're going to see the changes happening over time in those areas. But you'll also say what things stayed the same in Rome? Maybe it's the leadership style. Maybe it's what it means to be Roman or those, identi those identifi identifiable factors, including how you dress, what you ate, how you spent your leisure time. Those can be things that can be continuities or things that stay the same while Rome is changing and growing and its borders are changing and growing as well. So if you're a proficient student and you're able, you should be able to, number one, analyze and evaluate historical patterns of continuity and change over time. Number two, you should also be able to connect patterns of continuity and change over time to larger historical processes and themes. So being able to see how Rome's change over time is eventually going to impact the revolutions that are gonna happen later on in world history between the 1750s and 1900s and how those things are going to change and how they're gonna be influenced so much by Rome, but Rome's change over time is going to allow these later events to happen. All right. So that's your second skill. Once again, patterns of continuity and change over time. Skill number three is periodization. So historical thinking involves the ability to describe, analyze, evaluate, and construct models that historians use to organize history into discrete periods. To accomplish this periodization of history, historians identify turning points and recognize that the choice of specific dates gives a higher value to one narrative, region, or group than to other narratives, region, or groups. How one defines historical periods depends on what one considers most significant, political, economic, social, cultural, or environmental factors. Changing periodization can change and historical, a historical narrative. Moreover, historical thinking involves being aware of how the circumstances and context of a historian's work might shape his or her choices about periodization. So being able to think about bias as it relates to this. What is your historian or what are you looking at or what do you put at the forefront when you're looking at all the changes over time and all the things that are happening throughout history? Is it the cultural factors? Is it watching how society develops, how they maneuver, how they grow? When we think about the industrialization, culturally, we're gonna see a lot of changes. One of the most major ones that we're gonna see is that people are gonna move from the countryside into cities. We're gonna have what's called urbanization. So are we gonna look at the industrialization through an urbanization cultural perspective where you're saying, hey, this is how people are going to develop or are we going to look at industrialization from a political perspective and say, hey, now that we have these new cities, now governments have to actually create laws to regulate what happens in people's homes or in the job or in the education sphere or things like that. You can look at it from an economic perspective and say, well, now we have a lot more big businesses. Are the big businesses the things that we're going to use to classify how we look at history? If we look at it from an environmental perspective from, for, with industrialization, we're going to see a lot of chemicals, a lot of, deforest a lot of deforestation, a lot of pollution, a lot of negative things. Is that how people are going to start to classify how they look at history and how you period periodize different parts of history? So what's most important to the person who is both giving you the information as well as what's most important to you as you take in all of this content? All right, so proficient students should be able to explain ways that historical events and processes can be organized within blocks of time. So how are you going to organize what you see, what documents are in front of you, and things like that. You should also be able to analyze and evaluate competing models of periodization of world history. So if someone shows you a model that uses the cultural perspective and someone shows you another model that uses the political perspective, you should be able to compare those and evaluate those and get both the strengths and the weaknesses from both comparisons or both uh, types of history that are being shown to you. Skill number four is comparison. Skill number four is comparison. So historical thinking involves the ability to describe, compare, and evaluate multiple historical developments within one society one or more developments across or between different societies and in various chronological and geographical contexts. 
It also involves the ability to identify, compare, and evaluate multiple perspectives on a given historical experience. experience. So comparison, being able to look at two different things or even actually one society and say, hey, this is what was going on in this one society and how it compares. Or then also looking at other societies and saying, this is how Rome compares to the Mongol Empire. So the Roman Empire versus the Mongol Empire. But then also we can say, hey, what was happening in uh, North America between 1600 and 1750, but also what was happening in Europe during that exact same time period. So being able to compare things from inside of one place, comparing different societies, and then also comparing different regions. But you might also be asked to compare different time periods. So, hey, let's look at how they lived life from 1200 to 1500, or let's look at how they lived life from 1600 to 1750 and compare those two different things on a societal level, on a gender roles level, on a, uh, a, a cultural perspective and things like that. So if you're proficient, a proficient student should be able to do two things. One is compare related historical developments and processes across place, time, and or different societies or within one society. So once again, being able to look, let's look at North America between 1600 and 1750. Let's look at Europe between 1600 and 1750. Or let's look inside of North America and see how that compares maybe the eastern parts of North America with the western parts. Or even let's say, hey, time periods. What was happening in North America between 1200 and 1500 and then 1600 to 1750. And second, you should be able to explain and evaluate multiple and different perspectives on a given historical phenomenon. So during your document-based questions, those DBQs, you might be learning about the same event, but that same event might be coming from two different perspectives. So you might be learning about a war that happened and you might get one document from the people who lost the war and one document from people who won the war. You have to be able to compare those two different arguments and say, hey, one, here are the biases that could be present in these documents. But then also, let's see what's believable and what's not believable based on what I can see in the comparison. What are they both saying and what are they kind of differing on and things like that. So once again, that's going to be skill number four, comparison. <clears throat> skill number five, contextualization. So once again, skill number five is contextualization. That's the historical thinking that involves the ability to connect historical events and processes to specific circumstances of time and place and to broader regional, national, and global processes. So one of the easiest things to kind of bring in would be, like, let's talk about slavery and the transatlantic slave trade that was happening um, between <clears throat> like 1600 and the early 1800s. So if we think about context of what was happening, so a little bit of context about that. So slavery was happening in Africa well before European interaction. So that's one thing that's really important to know. So slavery was happening before European interaction um, with Africa. And so as we have more European interaction, um, Africans are gonna say, hey, let's continue to have slavery with Europeans because it just makes sense. Not necessarily understanding that the slavery with Europeans is going to be different than the slavery that they had inside of Africa that actually allowed slaves to achieve freedom, um, work their way out of a caste system, but in American slavery or European slavery, whatever system you were born into is where you stayed. So a little bit of context about slavery during that time period. That's a little bit of contextualization. So giving you understanding and broader information about whatever your topic is. And that can be focused on regional things, it can be national things, or even global things and how all these things are going to interact with each other. So if you're proficient, you should be able to explain and evaluate ways in which specific, specific historical events and processes connect to broader regional, national, and global processes occurring during that same time period. So one beautiful thing about our green textbook is that it literally takes you all around the world in one chapter. So it says, hey, let's look at this one time period and see what was happening in Africa, what was happening in Europe, what was happening in Asia, what was happening in North America, and it's in South America as well. And it's going to compare all of those things. That's going to give you some contextualization to what's happening on the global uh, arena in one area or in, in the world during that one time period. 
The second thing you should be able to do is explain and evaluate ways in which an event or process connects to other um, similar historical phenomena across time and place. So being able to draw a connecting factor. Um, so one thing that we hear about, hey, so how did these Europeans, how were they able to even leave Europe and go into Africa? Well, that's technology. They were able to improve their ships, um, understand wind technology and understand which direction the wind patterns were going in. So understanding that Europeans had a rapid uh, uh, advancement in their technology of shipbuilding, that's going to be important to understand how they were able to go around to Africa and then eventually go into slavery and place it and go and trade slaves in different parts of the world. Skill six is historical argumentation. So one more time, skill six is historical argumentation. Historical thinking involves the ability to define and frame a question about the past and to address that question through the construction of an argument. A plausible and per persuasive argument requires a clear, comprehensive, and analytical thesis supported by relevant historical evidence, not simply evidence that supports a preferred or preconceived position. In addition, argumentation involves the capacity to describe, analyze, and evaluate the arguments of others in light of available evidence. So being able to construct an argument, being able to take the documents or the information that's in front of you and turn that into something that is a viable argument that stands on its own. So Graber and I have been talking to you guys about explaining yourself and always making sure that whenever you answer, you say, I feel this way because in order to kind of train your brains into understanding argumentation and understanding that you always need to back up whatever you're saying with facts. So one example of that, we can look at the Rome. Once again, we can go back to the, the map of Rome and we can argue that Rome had the largest geographic empire ever. The way that we can argue that is by looking at the facts. The facts support that Rome had the largest geographic area. Looking at a map. So once again, I'm arguing that because it's based in fact. I'm not saying, man, Rome had control of North America because, you know, I love it. I believe it. It's the truth. That's not what's happening because that's not supported with fact and that's not that, that didn't actually happen. So making sure that your arguments are actually based in what you're seeing in front of you and not the preconceived notion that you might have in your head or the bias that might be influencing how you're thinking about a specific or given topic. So if you're proficient in your arguments, you're able to analyze commonly accepted historical arguments and explain how an argument has been constructed from historical evidence. So saying, hey, this is what their argument is, but how did they get there? And then looking at the different primary and secondary sources that were given um, and, and how they help to construct that argument. You're going to be able to do that yourself and see how historians create their own arguments based on the evidence that you see in front of you. Second, you're going to construct convincing interpretations through analysis of relevant and historical evidence. You're going to evaluate and synthesize conflicting historical evidence to construct persuasive historical arguments. So you're going to do what's called grouping. When you have your document-based question, you're going to group things. So you're going to have about seven documents. So maybe two of the documents are going to support an argument. Two of them might be against the argument. You're going to have to find a way to synthesize or bring those two um, uh, differing arguments together so that they work for you while you're writing your document-based question and your thesis makes sense and is supported by the evidence in front of you and once again not by a preconceived notion that you have. So that is skill number six, historical argumentation. Being able to support yourself with an argument but also being able to examine historians' arguments and see how they were able to get to those conclusions. Skill number seven, appropriate use of relevant historical evidence. So skill six links directly with skill seven. Historical thinking involves the ability to describe and evaluate evidence about the past from diverse sources, including written documents, works of art, archeological artifacts, oral traditions, and other primary sources, and requires the students to pay attention to the content, authorship, purpose, format, and audience of such sources. 
It involves the capacity to extract useful information, make supportive inferences, and draw appropriate conclusions from historical evidence while noting the context in which the evidence was produced and used, recognizing its limitations and assessing it, the point of view it reflects. So all of that was a really fancy and long way of saying, looking at the bias. So how are biases going to impact people? What is going to be useful from whatever primary sources you're looking at based on the different biases that you have been learning about since the beginning of the semester? So is it going to be a gender bias? Is it going to be an in-group bias, a gender one? Is it going to be a racial bias, a religious bias? Um, is it going to be a selection bias where the person only selected certain viewpoints and excluded other viewpoints? Is the historian suffering from a decline bias, which they believe that things were better back in the day and today they're all horrible? So understanding that bias and understanding how those biases are going to play a role in whatever documents you're looking at, whether that be a written document, whether that be a work of art, archaeological, even a photograph. And photograph can be biased because the person taking the photo, the photographer can say, hey, I want to zoom in on this portion and not the wider picture of what's actually happening in the scene. So being able to understand biases and how those relate to whatever sources you're going to receive, but then also once you receive those sources and you understand those biases, how do I know what information is relevant to me and to whatever assignment that I'm working on? So in order to be proficient on that, you have to analyze features of historical evidence such as the audience, the purpose, the point of view, the format, the argument, the limitations, and the context that are created um, and, and that are innate and natural to the evidence being considered. So once again, that bias, what's the purpose of it? Why did the author create these things? What was their purpose? When the author created it, who was their designed audience? What's their point of view? Is it gonna be first person? Is it gonna be something that's happening maybe 50 years after something had already happened? Which way are they looking at it? What's the format gonna be? Is it gonna be an interview? Is it gonna be a diary entry? What is it gonna look like? And what's their argument gonna be? How is it gonna be limited by historical scope? Um, so if we're talking about Chinese culture and Chinese literature, and it's about a, it's a European, uh, and our source comes from a European perspective, are they gonna be limited by some of their own beliefs because they're European and think that Asian culture is less than? And finally, um, you're also going to look at the context. So once again, so what else was happening in the world during that time period and how that plays a role in whatever your primary or secondary source is. You should also be able um, to base, um, you're going to have things that are based on analysis and evaluation of historical evidence. You're going to make supportable inferences and draw appropriate conclusions. So you're going to glean or take out the appropriate information from whatever document that you're seeing. So once again, skill seven is the appropriate use of relevant historical evidence. Skill number eight, interpretation. How you see things, how you interpret them, that matters. So interpretation means the historical thinking um, that involves the ability to describe, analyze, evaluate, and construct diverse interpretations of the past and being aware of how particular circumstances and contexts in which individual historians work and write also shape their interpretation of past events. Historical interpretation requires analyzing evidence, reasoning, determining the context, and evaluating points of view found in primary and secondary sources. One thing that you'll see when you're reading some of the things that are going to happen throughout history, you're going to look at them through, and you're going to interpret them through a 2020 lens. You're going to say, oh man, that's messed up. I, I would never do those things today. You're right. You would never do those things today because it's 2020. You might be looking at a document from 1500 when they didn't have running water or electricity. Well, they're not going to do things how you would do things today. So how you're interpreting things and what viewpoint you're looking at is going to matter tremendously. So even when we're talking about the different types of primary sources, so if we're talking about a primary, or excuse me, a secondary source that's written about an event that happened 300 years ago, is their interpretation going to be clouded by anything? It goes back to bias. Are they gonna have any biases based on what's happening in their life and, uh, uh, on an everyday basis? 
So how you interpret things, how you see things, how you interpret documents, that matters. And that's going to be very important to how you're going to function and how you're going to pass AP World History. So if you're going to be proficient, you should be able to analyze diverse historical interpretations. So being able to look at a document from 1970 that's talking about uh, maybe Caesar in the early Roman Empire, excuse me, at the end of the Roman Empire, or maybe being able to look at a document that was happening during Caesar's time period and see how those interpretations are going to factor into what's being said in either your primary or secondary source. You should also be able to evaluate how historians' perspectives influence their interpretations and how models of historical interpretations change over time. So as I said previously, if you're looking at history that happened in the 1500s from a 2020 lens, are we going to interpret things differently over time? Most definitely. So once again, skill number eight is how you interpret things, how you see things, and also how the historians that you're reading are going to interpret things and how their backgrounds and their biases can influence what they see, what they write about, what they bring to um, whatever document they're talking about. So once again, that selection bias or that conclusion bias or that decline bias or any other number of biases that we've been talking about. And the final skill is going to be synthesis. So skill number nine is synthesis. Historical thinking involves the ability to develop meaningful and persuasive new understandings of the past by applying all of the other historical thinking skills, by drawing appropriately on ideas and methods from creating different fields of inquiry or disciplines, and by creatively fusing together different parts and relevant and sometimes contradictory evidence from primary sources and secondary works. Additionally, synthesis may involve applying insights about the past to other historical contexts or circumstances, including the present. So being able to fuse all those different parts of history together. So if you're looking at the cultural perspective or the political perspective or the economic perspective or the social perspective or any other number of perspectives, how do those all work together? How do they all fuse together in one area? So going back to the Industrial Revolution, so how does the change that happen economically during the Industrial Revolution, how does that factor into the political changes? How does that factor into the social changes? How does that factor into the cultural changes um, and all the other changes that are going to happen? And we're going to fuse all of those things together and develop new understandings and new interpretations about history. You might look at all the things that happened with the Industrial Revolution once you learn about it and say, I think the Industrial Revolution was probably one of the worst things that could have ever happened um, on a social, on a societal, on a societal and cultural perspective and also on an environmental perspective because um, maybe you're going to say because we have so much more pollution and families spend less time together and then also now we have a lot more corruption and a lot more negative things that are happening throughout society because of the Industrial Revolution. So you're going to take all the information that you see and learn and you're going to create your own ideas and your own opinions based on what you see that's rooted and based in fact. So you're going to use those previous eight skills, skill one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight to lead you all the way into skill number nine, with this, which is synthesis. And so in order to be proficient in synthesis, you're going to draw appropriately on ideas and methods from different fields of inquiry and discipline. So being able to look at different things across, across different perspectives and seeing how they work together. You're also going to be able to com combine the different and sometimes contradictory evidence from primary sources and secondary works in order to create a persuasive understanding of the past. So looking at a primary source that was written when that uh, event was actually taking place, but then looking at maybe a document that's secondary that's written later that's analyzing what happened and maybe using some later historical information to influence what they're writing about. And the last thing. You're going to imply insights about the past to other historical contexts and circumstances, including the present. So being able to understand how the Industrial Revolution is factoring into your life today. You're going to say, hey, why? How does the Industrial Revolution impact my life today? Well, all the rapid advancements that we have in technology, that's directly related to the Industrial Revolution. But then also the fact that you guys have to go to school, compulsory education, 
all of those things are directly related to the Industrial Revolution. Something that happened in the 1800s is still impacting what's happened in 2020. So being able to fuse different ideas in different time periods and connect them and see how they're somehow linked and somehow comparable, that's what you're going to be able to need um, to pass your AP exam and to pass um, this course. So good luck and I hope you all understand your nine historical skills that will help you understand this course and understand what's needed for your AP exam that's coming up on May 10th of 2021. All right, guys, have a good one. See you later.